warm up. And uh, a lot of you have been around the block a few times. There's what we call the after conference blues. <laughs> kind of feel it over here today. So I, I'm not going to, I'm just going to preach, let you go eat. But, uh, we do have a lot of baptism tonight. These are powerful. Jesus Christ himself was baptized. How much more should you and I be baptized? Like Pastor Martin is telling that story. Baptizing that woman, he brought her up, and the demon was still there baptizing her. Yeah, she probably afraid she's that demon was afraid it's gonna drown. Amen. I'm coming out of here. But anyway, baptism is powerful, and we thank God for you. And so uh, all of your labors and faithfulness and effort makes all of this possible. John chapter 21. Uh, I want to make a statement uh, that is uh, absolutely critical. It's critical that you understand this for your salvation, any ministry. If for longevity with God, if you're going to spiritually mature and serve God for the long haul, somewhere you need to grasp this understanding. Because if you don't, you need to listen. Listen to what I'm going to say. Your love for God, your passion for God, and compassion for people must be greater than the pain you will go through in life. Your passion must conquer your pain. Pain of people. Pain of disappointment. Heart pain, it goes on and on. In other words, your passion must exceed and conquer your pain. Or somewhere you'll shut down spiritually. You'll compromise. You'll back out of the ministry. You'll quit. Worst case scenario. I want to minister for a few moments. Very familiar text. On your passion has to conquer your pain. Pain of your past. The list goes on. John 21. Verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Talking about passion. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, it's very interesting, his response to this statement. Feed my lamb. Then he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Very interesting. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said again to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and will carry you where you did not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death Peter would glorify God when he had spoken this. Then he said to him something again very interesting after all this conversation. He said, follow me. Uh, Lord, we thank you for these people, God. We thank you for all you've done this past week. It's a work of your hand, God. What a privilege, God. What a, what a glorious, glorious, humbling privilege be a part of this great move of God. We thank you. God, I believe in you. God, raise up workers and laborers. You said as we had sown, 
we would read, God, as we send these couples, I pray you multiply them a hundredfold in this place. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the pain of life and people are inescapable. You're not going to avoid this. Especially as a Christian. The Bible gives a term to it called the cross. You cannot follow Jesus to any degree of commitment and avoid the cross. Mark 8, 34, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Luke 14, 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Paul writes of those who are enemies of the cross, Philippians 3.18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So you have to ask, what's he talking about here? You're going to have to take this up. You're going to have to carry it up. Uh, you're going to, it's going to be attached to you. It's going to be a part of your portfolio and testimony. What's he talking about? I mean, many years ago, when I was a pretty new convert, 1970, I think, it was a man by the name of Arthur Blessed. Uh, yeah. You may remember him. He carried across all the way across the United States. Uh, got a lot of press, got to give his testimony, and etc. But that's not what this is talking about. A cross to bear. And there's a lot of, in the Philippines, I've been there before, normally around Easter, they will actually nail themselves uh, to these wooden crosses and etc. And uh, no doubt the cross has to do with suffering in the flesh. It has to do with rejection. It has to do with persecution. Uh, offenses, Jesus said, will come. It has to do with the reproach many times, the shame, the affliction. Hebrews 12, 2, a looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before endured the cross, and here he gives a little portfolio, a glimpse of the cross, despising the shame. And he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's not something in the Bible that you talk about that you wear around your neck. It's not a piece of jewelry. It was where they crucified people. It would be like you putting an uh, electric chair around your neck today and wear it or something. And so, and that's not, it's not a piece of jewelry. And so Moses kind of understood. He made some, there's some statements made in Hebrew. Uh, uh, 11.24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Listen to these words. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. That's a picture of the cross. Then to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, he looked to the reward. He talks about suffering affliction. The reproach of Christ has to do with people ridiculing you or rejecting you because of your faith. Uh, this is an emotional and a mental assault against what you believe and who you serve. Somewhere you will have to endure this. Maybe family, maybe parents, maybe a spouse, uh, maybe uh, uh, co-workers, laborers, classmates, uh, and so somewhere you must realize the cross and the pain of the cross comes through people. Who nailed Jesus to the cross? It's people. Who put the crown of thorns on his head and spit it on him? Who pierced his side with a sword? Who gave him the kiss of betrayal? Judas. All of these were people loved. I, uh, Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, we hid as it were our face from him. 
He was despised and we did esteem Him not. Who denied Him? Who hid their face? It's people. Peter, three times we read in the text, or we didn't read it in the text, but three times he denied the Lord. Cause no doubt Jesus. Who cursed him? Peter cursed him. A person. Who cried out, crucify him. Give us Barabbas, people. And so somewhere you need to understand when you're talking about taking up the cross, the pain of the cross, you're really talking about people. Zechariah 13, 6, one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Wounded by friends. And many times the real pain of the cross is not just many people, but it's people you know, people you've served, people who you've labored with, people who you've invested in, people who you've depended on, people who you've loved, uh, church people, people in ministry, disappointed you, say things that hurt you, reject you, failed you. Psalms 55, 12, David, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it, nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could have hid from him, but it was you, a man my equal, my companion, my acquaintance, we took sweet counsel together. We walked to the house of God in company together. Somewhere your passion, your love for God has to have the strength to overcome and conquer the pain of people. There's been an exodus from the pulpit, not so much in our fellowship, but I read articles and editorials. There's been an exodus from the ministry in the last 10 years. And, and they interviewed a number of these pastors. I'm not talking about people, pastors retiring. There's been a number of those too. But I'm talking about young people. And every one of them, the reason they left the ministry was people. That's why I thank God for you. Amen. People who make accusations cause you grief, tear you up inside, mentally, emotionally. How do you process that? This is why, right, it's so interesting to me. We know the story of Peter. He's denied, he's cursed, he don't know the Lord. And yet when Jesus deals with him, he doesn't break that up. What he brings up, do you love me? What's the thermometer of your passion for me? Peter, do you love me? Oh, do you know? No, no, let me ask you again, Peter. Do you love me more than these? I wonder if he's pointing at people. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Passion. will survive and must survive the pain. Jesus, Simon, 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 Simon. Think of all the things he could have asked you and all the things he could ask you. Why did you do this? How could you do this when I needed you? You're the one that said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. We're in the garden. You cut off a guy's ear for me. Come on. What? I mean, but... It's so interesting. How much, let me ask you, do you love him? Do you love him enough to join him on the cross? Do you love him enough that no matter what kind of pain comes at you in life, 
No, I don't know what kind of sorrow uh, could be a spouse, it could be a tragedy, it could be, it has so many, but no matter what kind of pain this world may deliver at your doorstep, <clears throat> or hell may throw in your face, what does your love for Christ, Lord, I'm willing to hang there with you. I'm going to hang in there with you because I love you more than any pain can hurt me. How many have ever been hurt by people? You don't pass them very long. I, I, I had flashbacks. I'm having a flashback even while I'm preaching this. Of people. Uh, one time I remember uh, this young man, and uh, uh, I took him to Mexico with him. This was in Marion, Illinois, in the early days, took him to Mexico with me. I, I left him in charge of the service when I came to the conference. I had all kinds of hope for this guy. And uh, I mean, I poured a couple of years into him. Uh, and uh, he wanted to preach. And I remember I came back from conference and he met a Baptist girl. <laughs> and she didn't want to speak in tongues. And so he said, Pastor, I'm late. How do you deal with that? Aided by time. I mean, like I said, we, we, we went to Mexico. We drove in those days together. Peter, this is the real issue. When you saw what people did to me and you caught what it was going to cost you, you had to make a decision. Were you going to deny me? Were you going to quit? The reason you cursed me, you didn't really love me enough. Luke 10, 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 24, 12 says, in the last days, the love of many shall wax or grow cold. The love of many in the last days because of the pressure because of the persecution, because of the attack, uh, the ridicule, uh, the, the rejection. It says the love of your, your love's going to melt like wax. The fire is going to go out of the candle. The passion will dissipate. In the last days, this is what, let me ask you, does your love for God is it greater than your problems? Is your love, your love has to be more passionate than the struggle, the season, the difficulty. It has to be more passionate than the temptation. Do you love me more than thee? And I don't know what he was talking about. I don't know what Jesus was pointing to. Do you love me more? What's your these? What is it that sucks away and, and zaps your passion? It begins to bleed off into these things. <coughs> and then you find yourself bankrupt when it comes to your passion and your love for God. Is it being drained out? If your passion cannot survive these the pain and problems and struggles and temptations and, and people, somewhere you'll compromise. You'll quit. You'll curse. Peter, when you felt the reproach of these people, you're one of them. John 18, 26, a relative of him who's here, Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied him, and immediately, the rooster crowed. What do you 
What do you do right here? What do you do? John 18, 18, Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The problem when your passion, when your love for God begins to be trumped by the pain of the reproach or the denials or the affliction, you will, you, it's not just you'll go neutral, you will join those who are crucified. I've heard people before. That's what it, it always concerns me when people want to step back from a position uh, where it could be ministry, could be uh, uh, in ministry, in the church, a, a place of passion, a place of zeal, a place of souls. Uh, and only because if you're not careful, you step back, but you don't quit. You just keep stepping until you join the very ones uh, that are instrumental in crucifying you. How's your love for God? Your passion for the book? For prayer? For people? How's your love? Paul writes to Timothy, talks about a generation of lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure. In other words, their passion for pleasures drew them away. It became greater than their love for God. In our text, it's interesting. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. You were you wanted. You did what you wanted to do, when you wanted to do it, went where you wanted to go. You walked where you wanted to. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you did not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. It's interesting. I was at the memorial yesterday for Pastor Glenn Clark, there at the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, native graveyard there in Prescott. And uh, he's not native, of course. He's from Oklahoma, but he's not native. I think he has some native blood in him. But I'm there. His, his wife's not able to be there. His children aren't able to be there. His grandchildren. They're, they're quarantined. They're in Guam. I got to FaceTime Donna, his wife, and she's talking to me weeping. Have a conversation. And I'm there, Pastor Greg Mitchell is officiating, and Donna's family's there, and I'm listening to him, and he makes a statement. He said, It's so appropriate for Glenn Clark. He had such a heart for the natives, nations, Philippines, Guam. Such a heart. He said it's so appropriate they had to bring his body back from the foreign countries. Most of his ministry has been out of America. They had to bring his body home because he died in a foreign land. God took him to a place. See, that's what passion, see, passion for God will take you places that you never expected. Passion for God will supersede your own self-interest. Passion for God, I'm wrong, such a small item. I know sometimes he, he would talk to me, and even when I was there, just so tormented, this little tiny island. Built this incredible work. You heard me preach about it. But, but, but here's a man that love for God and love for people yeah, trumped the pain of 
living most of your life out of the United States of America. Took him places. You see, what will happen is when you're totally in love with God, uh, he has the premier say over your will. Where you will live, how you will live, what you will do, what you will spend your life on. Oh, Peter, when you were young, you did what you wanted to do. But there's coming a time they're going to gird you. And if you know church history, they're going to crucify me. He said, don't crucify me like this. I'm not worthy to be crucified by my Lord. And they crucified him upside down. When what you want to do collides with what God wants you to do. Many times, it's the love for God that sways your decision. Nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross. I want to close with the thought. The cross is what released redemption. That's not just true of Christ, that's true of you and I. There's something about when we carry, when people nail us that prepares us for ministry. When your love for God is greater than the pain of the moment, and the pain of people. When you allow your flesh to be nailed, there's something in that. Why in the world did Jesus say, feed my sheep? What's that got to do with anything? Jesus on the cross. <laughs> Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. When you're in pain, can you see the bigger picture? You know, God loves flawed people. God uses flawed people. We launched a lot of flawed people up here this morning. <laughs> These, they crucified Christ, and yet he said, they don't know what they're doing. They don't see what I see. The church and the kingdom of God is inhabited, filled with imperfect people, chipped people, coarse people, people that things are broken, rude people, people who will upset you, people who will disappoint you, people who will hurt you. But listen, they have value to God. Let me ask you a question. I was thinking about this earlier this morning. If the prodigal came home to your house, would you take your ring off and put it on his finger? He spent your inheritance. He's been out living in the house. Would you, would you take your ring off, which signifies authority, would you take your ring off, put it on his finger? Take the robe, wrap it in. That's God. That's the heart of God. Some of you here, you need to understand, God deals with you as a father. I mean, let me hear about you. How did you do it? They messed up. You, you punished them, but you didn't dishonor them. Plus, maybe they was 47 years old or something. <laughs> That's another story. But anyway, I'm just messing with you. But, but he, you have to understand. And God expects you and I to be with people like that. What would you have done with Peter right here? People are at different stages of growth. 
different stages of maturity and revelation. Have you given up on people God wants to use? Well, seriously, what would you have done with Peter? He's out here in the parking lot cursing you. And you're on your way to prayer meeting. What would you have done? Would you let him preach in three weeks? I probably wouldn't. And that we understand it's outside. And so anybody can preach on the street. But I mean, would you envision this guy denying cursing? Would you envision him 3,000 got saved. I don't know anybody here that you preach one sermon and 3,000 got saved. This is a lesson with your theology. Can you look beyond the pain and see their purpose or their possibilities? Again, how would you have treated a ministry he didn't let him slide. He confronted him. But he didn't disqualify him. Do you love me, Peter? Peter, have you learned anything? And then this, this statement, feed my, feed my lambs. Care, I want you to care for my sheep. I want you to tend flock of God. In other words, Peter, I'm putting their spiritual health in your hands. They will never die by what you feed them, Peter. What do you feed people? What do you feed people? How do you respond? Do you love to point out their flaws? You love to make them feel bad? Look bad? How would you have responded to Peter? Who are you feeding and what are you feeding them? It's how churches grow. How do you affect other people? I wonder if he said, Peter, I'm going to measure how much you love me by how you feed and treat them. You keep saying you love me. I, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Lord? Okay, prove it. I want you to feed. I want you to take what you've learned. I want you to take what I've deposited in you. I want you to take out of your experience. In fact, Peter, maybe this failure qualified you to feed. I want you to now make a deposit that will nourish them. When people leave your presence, are they nourished? Are they rejuvenated? Are they excited for God? Are they, are they satisfied? Or when they leave your presence, are they like anemic? They're malnutritious. Your passion. Your love for God. Your love for God. Has to compute out. With how you minister. How you speak. How you treat. How you view people. How you process. What, what do you deposit in them? Made a statement. One of my sons on maturity. Mark a maturity when you understand the people who hurt you the most probably pre prepared you the most for your purpose. And I was saying, go take them out to dinner. That's what Joseph did. His brothers, they hurt him more probably than anybody. Family can hurt you like nobody. And yet he said, you meant it for evil. But God was at work in that pain. And he meant it for good that I'd be able to save many people alive. Here, let me take you to dinner. 
Let me load those donkeys. We got all kinds of grain here. And we got stuff I've been saving. Let me bless you. That's a mark of ministry. Can you minister to people who have hurt you? I mean, I mean, Peter had that had to hurt, that had to sting. I mean, Jesus, he's a bloody mess. It's a, it's a whole thing's a mess. And Peter, you, you're looking out in the crowd, and he's standing over there with the soldiers and the rooster crows. But it so amazes me how Jesus dealt with this man. And you need to understand that's how he deals with you. Mm, come on. That's how he deals with you and I. When we deny him, we're disobedient, we make mistakes, we sin, we fail. You gotta understand, that's how he deals with you and I. Just like that. Don't give up on him. He doesn't throw you to the curb. He'll allow you out of your pain, your mistakes, to minister. I ask you to bow your head with me this morning. Lord, we love you in this place. Perhaps you're here. Uh, you're not saved. You're not born again. You're not right with God. You're lost. Uh, there is nothing more tragic than to know about Jesus and yet have never given him your life. You're unsaved. You lost your back. So that's you this morning in this place. One simple prayer can change your world. One simple prayer can change your whole world. If you're here this morning, <coughs> say, Pastor, I need prayer. I, I need my world changed. I need my heart changed. I need my life changed. If you're here this morning. You want to be saved. You lift your hand. Come to that side to side. That's me, Pastor. I want to be right with God. I want to give my life to Jesus. Back slider. That's me. That's me. I want to come to Jesus. I want to ask you to stand your feet with me all over this building. Your passion has to conquer your pain. Please you stand your feet with me. I want to open these altars. You want to come and find a place to pray. I want to come and talk to you about Many times this is what qualifies you for fruitful ministry. Peter is one of the most fruitful in the New Testament. Qualifies you for fruitful ministry. Gives a weight to your words. If you're at your seat, you may be seated. Gives weight to your words. Gives weight to your words. Brings, I believe, a, a weight of conviction when you speak to people. Something powerful. When you survive pain, you mean the pain and condemnation, you know he's battling stuff. He went out and wept bitterly. You know the other disciples are pointing to Peter. We, we, know, we heard what you said, Peter. We know what you did. We, we can't believe you. You always talk about how brave you were. And look at you. But the love for Christ would not allow him to quit. Would not allow condemnation to beat him out of the race. Let's pray. Talk to God in this place. Talk to God and speak to God. Oh, God, God, visit this nation.